What I'd like to do to uh, this in this session is to cover what we did last session, and so that you can feel like, okay, I can get my breath and, and regroup. I believe very much in what I call spiral learning, which means that you get a concept, there's no doubt about it, you get traction on the concept, but it's really important to kind of revisit it quite often, and then it gets easier and easier and easier the more times you have that. So uh, what I'd like to do is to start by asking you guys to tell me whether these are dissonant, modal, or perfect dichord. So you can use your um, pictographs that you have, the one with the crazy dissonant, modal, perfect. I su so strongly suggest that you actually see those in your brain. If you don't have that, you're going to find that, did you notice this can happen if you don't see those words? It's as if you have a double click on a computer, like I've had to do, to get the screen to come up in your brain. It's as if, now what is that word? Ugh! And then you double click and it's modal. So this just means that it's not in the sort of short-term storage area in your brain. And that's why it's good to have all three words in your mind. This will become very natural. You won't even be aware of it. But having all three in mind all the time will be important. We'll be upgrading uh, here as we go along. So folks, tell me. Let me just do it rhythmically. Dissonant, modal, or perfect, OK? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two, three, four. One to three, one to three, one to three, one, 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 two, 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 one, 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 good. Now, you're going to start noticing in this session that you might make more errors. And the reason is the conscious mind is like, oh, yeah, I got it. And then it'll start taking over the hearing part. So what you want to do, it, try this right now. Keep really relaxed and just see what would happen. You see the things up there. It's almost like you're just Hubble watching and you're give, bringing back data to the Earth, okay? And that's all you're doing. And so you just sort of wait for it to come and there it is. Here we go. And one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. One, two. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, 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 two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, 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 one to theater, one to theater, one to theater. It's so hard, isn't it, to not predict you did fabulously? But it's yes. <coughs> Certainly. I think that it can be awesome to do that. The problem is in music we can't. So start with that, though. It can be because it means that there's less trying. And if you're singing internally, you absolutely can. I mean, I know of some really fine conductors who close their eyes or uh, performers who do. But the problem is it often means lack of contact with another person. So uh, if you feel like that, how many of you guys did close your eyes as you were doing that to help? Raise your hands. OK, thank you. Good, that's quite a number. So let's do an experiment. One of the things that I'll often say is that as we're focusing, we want to make sure that we're anchoring our thoughts such that we don't get addicted to any one position in the brain. So neurologists now know that there are very explicit or specific places that cognition can be taking place. It does vary from person to person. But definitely, we have these particular areas that we use. What I found is that it's really important for us to even do little experiments, like as you do it with me now, start by closing your eyes, still seeing the pictograph always in your mind, OK? Then what I'll ask you to do as we go along is to gently open your eyes without it changing your focus. That is, you open your eyes, and you might even be able to look around, but you still see the pictograph in your mind, OK? So the brain knows that it's an internal knowing or seeing that isn't necessarily actually there. And that's the most important thing. That is when the imagination has come into your brain and that therefore you now own it. That is to say it's yours for you. Here we go. Give it a whirl. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, one, one. One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 two, three, four. 
awesome. Okay, really, truly, that is very, very good. Did you notice the longer and longer I go, the more what I call your inner coach can come in and it can be like, okay, but she's gonna play, or you start thinking of something else. We'll talk about that momentarily, okay. So tell me what these are. Isn't it modal or perfect? Think of the rhythm. Good. Listen for the rhythm. <laughs> so if I'm saying it, what's the rhythm? Okay, you didn't have this problem at all in the first half and you've just proven something really important. We just did harmonicity. Okay, so in other words, that idea of expanding and contracting and now it's like that seven doesn't sound so bad anymore. I'm playing a 10, okay? <laughs> so, but listen. This would be modal. This would be perfect. You see what I mean? What's hard is we have to aim at the right thing. So you have to be just listening for rhythm here. But it's so hard to listen to pitches and think of them as rhythm, <laughs> okay? It's a bizarre thing. This is why physicists with whom I speak are, again, it's, it's, it's amazing because it's saying, wow, this is like a metronome. You wanna know what 60 is? I'm hearing wah, wah, wah. Two seconds. So it's versus or yeah okay right okay so let's give it a whirl. This one again is think of rhythm as if I'm still saying you know. Listen for the rhythm. Perfect. Perfect. Don't doubt yourself when others get it wrong. Perfect. Perfect. It is perfect. Perfect. Modal. Good. Feel it move. Modal. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Awesome. Again, that worked today seems to be bugging me today. So the thing about th this step is that it is so hard to be thinking about it as rhythmic, but I want to talk now about it in terms of expression. What does it mean? And this is really what makes a difference. So when I will work with children, they'll get this very, very quickly, <coughs> kind of scary quickly, but the thing is that I'll ask them very often what animals or creatures this is like. What do you guys think? Anybody? Spiders. Spiders. Yeah. What else? Anybody else? A hummingbird. Boy, you read my mind. Okay, so I found, keep going. What? A cat. Cat. Okay, I can tell you love cats. <laughs> How about this? Listen to this. What animal? Yeah. Fish? Yeah. So in asking people what they feel, especially children, this would be another one of about a thousand different research studies that would be wonderful to do. Um, the uh, children will often say, for example, I had a student from New Zealand who said the modals were a porpoise. A porpoise. It's a porpoise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, a dolphin. <laughs> okay, so, so, and of course the swimming. And, and of course, usually it will be, you know, insects like spiders or fast running predators, you know, or the feeling about dissonance when you hear this rhythm, I believe it does elicit a pleasure pain boundary. That is to say, I think that it goes into the pain realm. That is when we hear ta 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 often in film, of course, da, 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 you know, it's, it's meant to be like shivering or to elicit feelings of movement or concern. I, I think that it actually is things that are on their move, uh, the move from one place to another. That's what I think dissonant dichords feel like. Therefore, I say they're like the gut. They're like gut words, like movement. And then the very beautiful 
So they have a sense that they are going from one thing to another. All right. So it means when you he see a spider, <laughs> it elicits a kind of fear response. But the reason I was interested in the hummingbird, I was waiting for that to happen, and I hope we don't just. But um, uh, one of the things that's very uh, compelling is that in the last five years, I've noticed that more and more people are saying things like hummingbirds which is not a negative or fearful thing. It's just a fast thing. Right. I had a little boy with whom I worked who was blind uh, from birth, and he loved music. And his parents wanted me to m just experience him, which was a great honor. And this little boy would go to the piano. And you know, when I was being introduced to him, he was like, hello. And then he goes walking off blind, finds the piano bench of his piano teacher, sits down at the piano, pi and he does this. And he would go really loud, I mean really loud, with his little hand, four years old. You know, and he would be experimenting, listening. And then he did this. Accidentally, he went, you know, he was going, and then he was moving blind, you know, and he did this. Whoa! And he went, whoo! You know, he was like, and then he listened to it. Like, and he actually did this almost ecstatic, um, sort of trembling, you know, <laughs> that went with it. So the idea is that the dissonant intervals in melody or in harmony tend to act that way. An example of that would be this. Where's it going? To there. Where's it going? To there. Of course. So that's why in the past, composers, now we do, but they wouldn't just jump around like that because where are we going? Okay, so it sort of feels like we're just having a lot of word connections and we don't really know where we're going. So there are very strict rules about how you would have a harmonic sound, beautiful, harmonious, I should say, consonant sound, a third or a sixth, followed by a dissonant sound that would then immediately have to go to a consonant sound. So composers were really sculpting to create a very smooth effect, but that isn't necessarily what we want in jazz. So the hummingbird versus spider thing is I think that we are becoming much more adapted in this culture to being able to tolerate dissonance as not being a value judgment. In other words, garlic is not bad. <laughs> All right, lemon is not bad. In certain contexts, it can be really awful. Peanut butter and lemon, I don't recommend so much. But definitely, you know, it's in general, they're very, they're just different flavors. And so it is here. So now, folks, tell me um, whether I'm playing a second or a seventh. Okay, so you see the word second, and then the word seventh over here, and then, you know, the seventh the upper note is looking up here. I'll say there's a kind of a shadow or pull up to the octave, and then here a second is being pulled down to. Okay, this one is a seventh, good. Third or sixth, okay? Get that same thing, remember with the sixth especially, it'll tend to be because it will create a nice melody of something with which we're familiar. Put yourself between the two pitches. That's a secret to telling uh, these, these guys apart, okay? So this one is a... So listen to how that top note... Put yourself between the two notes, now watch. Watch. Okay, those first ones are always going to be devils, all right, to get right, so... Listen to a third. Do you notice how the third feels like it's this way, grounded, all right? So these are the modal ones. Modal dichords are going to be, I believe, referencing what I would say is, is the heart. That is the feeling of movement that's at four hertz, feels almost like a kind of a nice trot that dogs, you know, when you're walking your dog, they're trotting at about four hertz, okay? It feels like something that's relaxed and balanced and yet not stiff, okay? So I say that it's like the heart. So you folks, tell me whether I'm playing thirds, um, sixths, seconds, or sevenths. I'm going to put them in, okay? So <laughs> thirds, thirds. Mm -hmm. Seventh. 
Real loud. Second. Good, thank you. Awesome. Very good again. Okay. Bravo. So now, <clears throat> so when I have something like this, so Brahms, this is moving a melody note, which is a, a melodic, what we call melodic or horizontal third. And so it feels At the same time, it's playing vertically. These are seconds in the melody, but six underneath. So it's going E, C, C, E, E, C, C, E, F, E, D. So you can see the melodic line even feels dissonant because it's on its way. It didn't go. It did. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Well, we don't know yet. So when the melody line has seconds and thirds, it works much the same way. So I'd like to take this to the next level and ask you to tell me whether I'm playing seconds and thirds in a melody. Okay? So if I do this, it's a second, right. And it feels like where are we going versus watch. Third. Okay, so it feels like I'm saying an emotional word like tenderness, love, affection, compassion. With a second, it feels like I'm saying, and then, what if this, what, what? Ah, okay, so second or third. You can actually use the same word, uh, way they look, second versus third, okay? So, second, second. Second, second. Third, like I'm talking. Second, good. So when you answer too fast, it's because actually you're, you're working too hard. Um, try this now because you're doing great. I'm going to ask you to just feel like you're, have any of you guys water skied before? Some of you have? Okay. I have not, but I've watched a lot of people doing it and learning. And they all tell me that when you water ski, you've got to learn how to trust. You don't have to stop doing this like you're pushing the boat. And you have to kind of learn to lean back and just trust the boat and your balance and go back. It's kind of the same thing here. You're gonna to wanna to just be real passive again. I, that's why I love the image of the Hubble telescope. It's just up there doing whatever until it's told what to do and then it does it perfectly, okay? Most of the time. So here we go, our ears better than Hubble. This is gonna be second, 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 second. I'm telling you a story, third, third, third. Awesome. So a lot of it is just kind of relaxing and, and trusting. That was excellent. Okay, now, said the perfects. So what are they? So the perfects, you know, we did these, dichord, it's a fourth or a fifth. I bet you guys can tell me. This is a fourth because the upper note pinches and it also looks down. And this is the fifth. This time you're not gonna call it the, the number of semitones, but just generic. This is a fourth, 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 fifth, fifth. Fifth, real loud, fifth. Good, and now 
you folks will tell me when I'm playing a melody, whether I'm playing a second, third, or a fourth. You'll know a fourth because, as I was mentioning, that perfect fifth and its slow interference pulsation seems to communicate in my work, uh, thinking, scrutinizing, reflecting, contemplating. It is what I would call head in its orientation. It's, so it's definitely thinking. So watch this. Second, second, second. It's just, I think, by the way, that's the interval used. You know, very in Spock's interval in Star Trek. So it feels like it's scrutinizing, okay? Versus, listen, the third, which feels like I'm, I'm saying tenderness, love, affection. Now it's like studying, reflecting. Okay, so you're actually using the interference pulsation. I believe the brain is hearing the first pitch and the second pitch. And in the same way you're putting together a sentence, though we're not hearing all the words at once, it's able to understand how each one of the parts re it works with the other. So you're listening note to note and word to word, which by the way is quite challenging because this is sort of atonal. All right, so here we go. This is gonna be second, second, Good. And then this is like, I love the word in this piece, born free, because it feels like it's almost a, you know, kind of a clean thought versus feeling free. <laughs> this is more straightforward. Okay, so try it again. So this is much harder. Fourth, fourth, fourth. Try to bind them together, fourth, fourth, third, second, 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 second. Yeah. All right. So again, if I take a beautiful piece like this, I'll play it in the wrong key. Rachmaninoff. Want to tell me whether they're modal perfect or dissonant? Okay, so from this note, what do you think? Dissonant? Dissonant? Where's it going? Perfect. Oh, it sounds much too... Oh. Modal, dissonant, dissonant, perfect. Okay, this is much, much harder. Now do you see, in a lot of your training programs, what they'll do is they'll tell you that hearing melody is easier than hearing harmony. That is not true. Hearing melody requires an incredible amount of sophistication because you have to bind the pitches together in your mind. Obviously when you sing, you only sing one note at a time, but it's crucial that it's not this. say it, but I heard it play like this once. And I'll just say the brain here is no intervals at all. It has no sense of that um, ability to tell how far I'm moving. And it's destructive to the mind of the listener. Whereas if I go, Okay, I know what I'm saying, I'm like an actress or an actor. You know, I'm, I'm knowing what the words are and that I'm saying a modal word and versus a perfect word or versus a dissonant word, okay? So we're gonna do some atonal stuff which will actually make it easier. Tell me whether you think this is a second or a third atonal like this. And you should get these wrong. Second, <laughs> second, 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 third, 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 Third. Second. 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 Good. Easier, isn't it? Let's do this now. That's because it's easier to hear these intervals atonally than tonally, which is why we're going to get into tonality in a minute. Okay? So here we go. Same thing. Now I'm going to do this. Watch. I'll put in a perfect fourth. Okay? So you'll say fourth and you'll know it. Okay? So here goes. Second.
third. Good. Fourth, fourth, fourth. Second, second. Good. So now I want to ask you to, I'm telling you a story now. So I would go like this and you would go, I get it, it's a fourth. It's a secret code word for a word that means that I'm thinking about something, I'm contemplating something. And so it's as if I'm trying to tell you a particular story and that you're just listening and we're speaking a secret code language, which is second, third, and fourth, and no one who's been uninitiated will understand it, okay? So when I do this, that's a fourth, okay? And it feels verses, by the way, in your monochord, it is okay so if you almost imagine moving just vip, just sort of on an imaginary monochord it will help you a lot but that space equals an emotion which is an incredible thing so here's a fourth second second third 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 Let your ear do it. Second, 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 third, second, second, third. How many, what do you guys think this is? How many vote for? Good. Now, we need to talk about this at this point because we're now getting beginning to get errors in here. And uh, this is the perfect time. It, uh, it's always a little bit different in each uh, workshop that I do, uh, dependent on, on the group. It's wonderful. It's always at the right time. I want to talk about the three causes of error, okay? In my experience, there are only three causes of error. All of them relate to the conscious mind working too hard, <laughs> okay? And this is what is now, we now seem to understand that our conscious mind is somehow related to what is called executive function in the brain. So it's a part of your brain, and prefrontal lobe up here, that is actually determining what you're doing. And it's of, often trying to analyze things or figure things out. It's so important to us. A uh, man on the bus last night, whom I had the honor to talk, said that his, his daughter was in a terrible accident and lost part of her prefrontal low because of the, in the accident. Luckily she survived, but it affected her judgment and so it's made it very difficult for her. She's doing, she's recovering, the brain is plastic. But it's so hard because she has troubles with self-control. And um, so ultimately I believe that all the problems I'll describe come from our an overactive mind. We're gonna see if, to, if we can just eliminate them. The first cause is the most common and it's called reaction. And that's when you're suddenly surprised by something I did and then you can't get the word out. You might've had that experience today where it's like, <laughs> okay, cause I did something that surprised you. In this case, it's almost like, do you notice it's almost like this happens. It's called a zoom. Bandler, uh, Richard Bandler calls it a zoom because of the fact that it often feels that everything is this close to you. If you've ever had to sing or play a difficult passage and it comes up and it's like, ah! It's this big. Well, what they now figure, they understand is that when things go into a zoom like this, it's actually a limbic response. It's, a, it's your brain going into a freeze state because it's surprised. And what it's saying is, ah, do that, protect. And so you freeze. And then it's very hard to get yourself going again. So. The reason that I believe that this is detrimental to music is, of course, if we're in that part of the brain, it's harder to be up in the other part of the brain where you need to be to actually do this other function. But the limbic system is very strong. So in a reaction, this is how you'll know you'll have it. You can't get the words to come out. Or as a musician performing, you cannot seem to be able to get the notes to play. And no matter how hard you try, you can't. And of course, it's because you're in a terrible Zoom. So it was a kind of a funny thing. Um, Bandler and Grinder did this experiment on people who were phobic about spiders and what they did was reframed and what they found was people who were arachnophobes could not stand to have even the imagination of a spider and they have now proven this the people can have an imagination of a spider and have as much a limbic response as if they actually encounter it Elizabeth knows so this is a very very challenging thing because 
what this means is that it's a real distortion of reality. They will see that spider as huge, cloying, awful, hideous, you know, who knows, smelly, whatever else might come to mind, but it's really close. What Bandler and Grinder figured out was that they could ask the people to reframe and actually dial back the spider. And so what they would do is they would check the, with biofeedback how they were responding when they were even imagining a spider, and it'd be awful. And what Bandler and Grinder would ask, then ask the uh, patient to do is imagine they have a dial, and they dial it back. They just basically imagine that as they turn the dial, the spider moves back, and their respiration, heart rate, and, and the uh, function of the hormones was lessened at that point. Now, they did something even more funny which is they got it to a more comfortable place, not too close, not too far. And then what they did was they put a beanie or something like that on, on the spider. So, you know, let's put the beanie on the spider. And instantly, even though it was pretty close in their imagination, the same size, it felt better. Okay. So, and then what they did, well, let's, let's make this, let's put tennis shoes. We're going to put eight tennis shoes on this spider. And of course, the person's laughing like you are, and all of a sudden, things are looking good in terms of the heart rate and hormones. It's called reframing in their term. And what th this actually does is it helps people to embrace what they're afraid of. And for us musicians, we're very sensitive. And if we don't embrace or love everything, it can surprise us or cause a fear response. Okay, and a zoom, and it can make you feel like you're paralyzed, and, and no need. Okay, so the brain is actually going into that fight. I love this now: fight, flight, and freeze. When I was younger, there was no freeze; it was fight or flight. Now it's fight, flight, or freeze. The F word, another one. So, um, what we want to do to help is to always see all of our possibilities. So, the antidote to reaction is eagle vision. That is, you know your domain. There are 12 pitches and 11 dichords. Piano, I don't care what octave, there are 12 pitches on there in every octave. They're the same old thing over and over again. And so it's this idea of just, <sighs> I know it. So you might have noticed you had a reaction because you were waiting for that fourth. You're just waiting for that fourth. And then I play it, and then you have a freeze, and then it's, you get it wrong anyway. So. <laughs> So the thing is, w to f help to antidote this, I believe that you have to, quote unquote, my own way of thinking of this is we need to know what we're listening for and make sure there's clear instruction for what Hubble's supposed to be focusing on, in this case, this, uh, the emotional aspect. And then what uh, you also want to be able to do as much as possible is if you begin to feel like you're afraid of something, you have to become what I call a race car driver, and that is you have to just love those really dangerous turns. I mean, they live, from what I hear in interviews, for those really dangerous, you know, times when there are all these cars that gather together, and that's when they're like, mm hmm give it to me. So it's that attitude like uh, Bruce Springsteen has. Bruce Springsteen gets excited about it when he, when he performs. His adrenaline's running. He's extremely excited. He's nervous. He, you know, he'll say it. He's nervous. But he interprets it as, yeah, I need this to go out there and blast through. Um, on the other hand, Barbara Streisand, quite the opposite in the past. I mean, it's, so, it's terrifying for her. So she's framed it in that way, and I think she works very well with that. I wish I could sing like that under the worst circumstances. So the idea is that we want the, to embrace the thing we're afraid of. If you're afraid of the fourth, it's got to be, I, I'm, it's not that I don't love the second and the third as I'm hearing them, but it's like when it comes, it's like, I love you, you know, <laughs> instead of, uh, 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 mm, <laughs> bad. And you can see that this is the challenge is when we start saying that a dichord is bad. There are only 11 of them. So we don't want to be alienating our only 11 potential <laughs> playmates, you know, that we have. So um, now, let's do that one more time. So that is called against reaction. Just see what would happen. Okay, let's see what happens. So second, 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 second. You know everybody, second. Good, good. Second cause of error, anticipation, all right? Usually you'll be able to tell a reaction because there will be a stop. You can't, it's hard to go on. And you can recover, which you're very good at doing. But this is different. This is when you answer right in time and it's dead wrong. So you will know an anticipation because it's right in front of your face that everyone can see or hear, but you call it something else, 
all right? And this will happen, I believe, because the brain is disengaging from the senses and actually going into its own thoughts. So do you notice when you have the anticipation, it's usually your coach that's going, I bet she's gonna do this, or I bet, oh, I bet it's that, instead of, ooh, I love the taste of that, you know, mm. you know, it's less sensual and much more in your head. So what you want to be doing instead is let your ear lead you, and we've done this together and you've done it fabulously. When you have anticipation, the cure is, let your ear lead when you're listening and just trust it and, and just go back, okay? So let's try that. By the way, I t what tell my students, if they get things wrong, I'll just say, you're delusional. You wanna see I'm playing a fourth. <laughs> or it's like saying, tasting lemon and it's saying it's orange. And you don't want to do that very much because your brain gets confused. It's very important that it's the right thing and that it's what you intend it to be because you love it, not because you're afraid of it, okay? So here we go, seconds, thirds, or fourths. Second, very good, second. Good, you got the fourth. The third cause of error is looking back, okay? <laughs> okay, so the first cause of error was reaction. You could tell it because <laughs> you stopped. Second cause of error, you just got it right, but then you start looking back. You go, wait a minute, was that right, huh? Wait, wait a minute, so, okay. So looking back is very natural for the brain, but it's very deleterious. And I, when I was studying with Boulanger, she just said it right out. She drove me crazy because of this, because she could really tell when I was doing it. She could tell when I was looking back. I would be playing my Beethoven sonata for her, but all of a sudden, it just wasn't quite great. And that is the characteristic, unfortunately, of looking back. You can keep going, but you're really not engaged in your senses, but actually your brain is even more disengaged than with an anticipation. At this point, you're actually in a completely different place where you're judging or assessing. This means you can physically be looking back if you're reading music. I don't know whether you guys have had that experience where you look, you're reading along and it's like, you're reading back like this. Well, Boulanger said, let's be clear about it. If the train is moving like that, this is music, and you start going back like this, uh, you're way off from the train. So you can't jump off the train. The train is going forward and you're going to have to stay on it, okay? so. When you have this problem, I call it coach in, and I think it is the executive function, I'm guessing, okay? So that this part of the brain, by the way, is supposedly turned off in really great improvisers. From the research we know now, that may not hold true because it's recent, but what's being found is that really great improvisers when they're in MRI, fMRI, uh, when they're improvising, uh, which is not easy to do when you're in one of those tubes, but when you're like this, <laughs> Uh, improvising, what's very interesting is that the executive function of the brain shuts out, okay, it's turned down, all right? And you know this, right? And your really great performances that you have in our, our golden <coughs> moments, we're not having this, what I call, inner talking. So to me, the characteristic of um, looking back is for those of us who are auditorially oriented is it can be actually not just looking back or feeling like you're being pulled back, which is the kinesthetic or you know sensory version. Instead, it's auditory. It's your coach saying, you idiot, oh, you, can, you blew it, or watch out, you're gonna get that wrong. I knew you were gonna get that wrong, okay? Uh, and that is like a swimming coach who's got this fabulous athlete who's now swimming laps in a meet, swimming meet, and the coach jumps in and starts yelling at the, the, the athlete. You can't really listen to what's right, you can't really listen to what's going on in your head, and you certainly can't be engaged in swim, the poor athlete's done, okay? So it's the coach in, and it, I believe that the antidote truly is say, coach out, and it's just like, you guys are too young for it, but you know, it, for a while there, it was really nice to have Dr. Evil with his zip, you know, zip it thing, <laughs> you know, just zip, you know, but it's absolutely crucial. For myself, honestly, I have an image that's multi-sensory. I imagine that the coach is in the swimming pool and then <laughs> is sucked out and is put up over there. <laughs> and that, and it's, it's, 
can't hear a thing. Okay. So, but it has to be out of there. So it's very natural to start thinking, but you'll notice it takes you out of sensing. And this is one of our challenges, isn't it? I mean, we have to be aware of what's happening, especially conductors and wow, or performers of any kind. You guys, when you're doing opera, for goodness sake. You have so much you have to keep track of, but you notice the more you're having to think about your stuff, the less you might be in character. And so the thing is to be able to more or less, <laughs> uh -oh. so the, the thing is to become more or less relaxed and to trust, it really is crucial to just trust. I ask my coach to jump, to stay out before he gets going. All right, so before we do this one this time, I'm gonna ask you to imagine that you're, you're uh, understanding and loving the seconds and what they mean. Thirds, you're doing very well. Imagine the forests and what they're expressing, and there's no work for you guys. And then what I want to ask you to do is to also just let your ear tell you what it is without any judgment or assessment. Mm -hmm. So no looking back, uh, don't worry about it. If it's, uh, there was a mistake, it's gone. And now we're in the present. Why pollute the present moment? Which is really what Mademoiselle Boulanger was telling me. Why pollute the present moment? Why ruin that? Because of something that happened in the past. Okay, we can fix it. All right, so here we go. Second, third, or fourth? Second. Good, nice and loud. Third, third, don't worry about it. Third. Understandable that you might have thought it's a third. Guess why? It's a dichord two. But listen, it feels like it's open-ended. Listen to if it had been a third. You would have known it, okay? But it sounded big. Did everyone feel that kind of when I played that second? That's why, so it's, you're not crazy. But it has at the same time that feeling of being, we're not done yet, okay? We're, we're moving on, all right? Keep going, excellent, everybody. Second, second, just enjoy, second, 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 second. Very good. And see, the thing is, the more, do you notice the more relaxed you are, the easier it is. So there's a rather high payoff for it. And you're also learning about the three causes of errors. Uh, this um, idea can be so helpful um, as we continue on together because we're doing, you're, we're doing a great deal of new information. Although I want to emphasize for your metaconsciousness, it's old news, okay? We're just communicating. So we're having a contact with Hubble, and that's mostly what's happening. And that's why it's so important that when Hubble gives us a command, it says it's this, that we're acknowledging that so that we know we're on the same path, okay? I so much appreciate when you're speaking loudly because it's very helpful feedback. And increasingly, you'll hear me, by the way, no judgment. I want to say I love you all unconditionally, <laughs> okay? And I especially have a great admiration for you for being here and appreciation. So if something is happening, I'm doing the same thing that you are, which is letting it, it's gone. But I'm also, you know, I hope helping to be able to get you so you feel more and more relaxed and more and more confident. Okay, that's, so that was an atonal melody. Now, <clears throat> we'll be talking a lot more about this in the future, about how harmonies work and chords and what they express. So uh, I would like to now get to the pictograph. So thanks to my wonderful colleagues. <clears throat> I guess we're gonna start with this. Um, uh, the the um, overtone series looks very complicated. <laughs> but what I wanna do is more than actually doing anything with it, I want to just show you it, okay? So luckily now we begin to talk about the fact that indeed we hear overtones. But I'll have to say, honestly, 20 years ago, even 15, that was not thought to be the case. And in fact, uh, it was the basis of my work from the beginning because Mademoiselle Boulanger emphasized it as a reality. 
So one of the reasons her students, like Aaron Copeland and Samuel Barber and others, were so great, um, Rorum, etc. So um, everything would relate to the overtone series. So let me show you this. Now I'm not going to play the overtone series by playing the notes. I'm actually going to play them by playing a half step around them. Okay, because actually, as we saw, you're already hearing them. All right. So if I do this, this is my great C, what we now call C2. Okay, so we already know about the next partial. It's an octave higher. Right, I'll play a half step above. Right. And of course, the reason that one is non-harmonic, and so is the 11, is because they're a semitone away from that partial, okay? Now, the next partial is a perfect fifth higher than that. It's a G. By the way, it's following Pythagoras' theory so far. So I'm going to play a half step lower. Half step above. So what I'm saying is when I'm playing this minor sixth and eight, I'm actually hearing this. Now I'm not playing it. Okay, so that is why the eight is not in the overtone series and that's why it has that acidic, dense, contracting sound among other reasons, okay? Right. Next partial is an octave higher than the other octave. So I like to call it the super octave. <laughs> okay. Right, of course. Below it. So you're hearing two octaves above, okay? So the next is going to be the note E, half step below it. <laughs> so this is like, remember this piece? I did play the resolution. There it is. And by the way, you notice the piano is not in tune with it? We do that again. Piano note? Yeah, it's not the same. It's in full temperament. Okay. Okay. Half step above it. And the reason the perfect fourth resolves downward to a major third. Very satisfying. The next one, an octave above the third partial. That is a G, another G up there. Super quint. <laughs> Yeah. Right, and it's the sixth partial we're hearing. Right, and that's why when I wrote this piece, you know, it sounds very tragic actually, but that's that first inversion major triad. You take out the upper note, you know, so I'm really hearing that gives it that modal and perfect anguish. They're a half step apart. And a, so not harmonic die chords, my Mozart chord. Okay. So then the next one is a surprise. It's the seventh partial. It's our die chord 10, minor seventh. from above, it's harder. The piano note, much higher and out of tune because the piano is tempered so I can play in all keys, but it's not in tune. So you could sing some gloriously beautiful, pure minor seven, and then the piano comes in and does, and you, yeah. So that's why you have to know who you're playing with, okay? Great composers will avoid that, okay? The next one is again, now guess what, our double super octave, octave above, two octaves above the octave. 
but you're probably hearing it going up above it makes it easier here it is still a little out of tune that's the eighth partial all right we're awfully high the next one is the ninth a half step higher than this note which is oh, I can't sing it anymore I'm too old but you guys probably can So this is Schumann. Okay, so it's just so beautiful because of the fact that that actually that major second above the bass is actually a harmonious sound, and the dominant ninth chord, as we call it in music, is the real note. <laughs> okay, and thus that's why. It feels like it's open instead of closed, okay? So these partials are the ones that I call uh, the ones that we're really going to be concerned about through the ninth partial. In the end, it's thought that all pitches above the fundamental will show up at a higher and higher octave if we haven't seen them. And indeed, that does seem to be true, except for one interval, the perfect fourth, which seems to not be anywhere that it's the, the tritone is the 11th partial, a relatively low partial. So this devil in music partial is actually the 11th partial and it's pretty well in tune. Okay, I probably. It's really hard to hear. It is there, but it's just barely a whisper. Okay, but that's the 11th partial. So it seems like we hear through the ninth partial pretty well. And that, that seems to be important information for our brain. The rest of them, are not and therefore they're non-harmonic so the notes that are in the overtones would be like if i have c well i just saw a d's in there and that will mean that no matter where i play a d it sounds harmonious strangely enough even down here though muddy thus harmonic the magnet of like polarity that repels and it's dissonant of all things. And then the seventh, even that sounds nice. That's the dichord 10, which is why you wanted to call it a modal interval before, which is understandable. There's my 10. Doesn't that sound awful? That's a minor third. It's not in the overtone series because that is the major third, which is four semitones, four. Frankly, all you needed to know is it does this or that. But what we can hear is, watch this. You know this is harmonious. That's the seventh, the perfect fifth. In any octave above the bottom note, it'll be harmonious. Now watch this. not in the overtone series, and you already know probably, it's the eight, okay, so it's, so here's a minor sixth, it's supposed to be really nice and harmonious, right? Listen to this, minor third, perfect fourth, almost equally bad as this, which is an 11, which is worse, a major seventh or a tritone, well, I mean, a perfect fourth, rather. They're almost equally rough, and here's the minor sixth, minor third. So if you've ever had troubles getting a note, it can be because you're having to sing a non-harmonic interval above the bass. And it, it's really hard because it's not in there. And you have to almost will it to be able to sing it up high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that is why the, some of the p uh, pitches are going to be in what I'm going to, excuse me, uh, show you now, the pictograph. Excuse me. So here <laughs> is what I call the um, pictograph. And this is sort of the completed series of how the 11 dichords work with their three features. We've already actually done these together when you were telling me whether it was a one or a two or a three or a four, a five or a seven, an eight, a nine, a 10, or an 11. So you've already actually done it. So the uh, thing is, you'll notice up here, I found it so hard for po folks to get used to the idea that, ooh, 
you can have a dissonant interval that is in the overtone series that's harmonic. So it can be at once dissonant and at the same time open and expanding. And it's the brain has, the adult brain, has troubles reconciling that because it doesn't seem possible. How can you have something that's dissonant and yet is harmonious? But we do, and in fact, Mahler understood this. He broke some rules when he wrote this. Have any of you guys sung this? Mahler. It's one of his songs. Okay, so he starts like this. It's dissonant, but it's harmonic. And it's one of the most glorious sounds, I think, in music. I often say, that when I die, I want to encounter that interval. I don't want to encounter this interval. <laughs> Judgment day, or that. It would be even worse. But this, it feels like it's transitioning. It's going somewhere. It's that white light, and it's very active and very brilliant, but it's beautiful. Listen to the one. Beautiful also, but very, very different and pungent and a completely different character. So both one and two are dissonant, jagged edges. You're going to notice that they have a shadow on the left side. That just means it's looking down to the fundamental. You know, seconds, the upper note looks down. So there's going to be a shadow on the left. And then finally, the one is this intense violet color to represent that it's non-harmonic. But then it's going to be pale colored for the harmonic. Okay, so the idea is, watch, one, 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 two, 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 two. Try those with me, you guys, I already have them. Two, 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 major second, two. Real loud. Let your ear do it. Yeah, good. All right, three and four. Three is not in the overtone series, four is. Minor third, not. Three, 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 four, four. Let's give it a whirl. Four, four, I wish they were animated. Four, 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 three. this. Who is that? Yeah. Good. Awesome. Good. Okay. Five or seven. The perfect fourth. Five. Not in the Overton series. Seven is. Thus it's pale in color. The number five has straight edges because it's perfect and it's a shadow on the left because the upper note's closer. The seven. Straight edges is perfect. Two hertz. It's also harmonic. It's in the overtone series and the upper note looks. Yeah. Okay, so five or seven. Five. 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 but not harmonic, that upper note, as you know, is not in the overtone series. It's got this beautiful, at the same time, emotional feeling. It's looking up to the octave. Different than the minor third, the three, which is looking down. At the same time, it's pulling against this guy, which is the third partial, the perfect fifth. But don't feel bad, because if it goes down even, that's still going up. So even though it's resolving down to the fifth, it's going, Okay, so here's eight, 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 eight. Nine. Go ahead. Eight, good, nice and loud, eight. Terrific. 
Oh, good. Let's finish it off. 10 and 11. Now, 10 and 9 are, you notice there are two numbers that look quite similar, excepting the 9 is modal and the 10, that's a major 6, and then the 10 is dissonant, so it's going to have different edges. So they should sound quite a bit alike, which is kind of surprising. Listen to the 9. Poor guys, it's so late. 9, 9, 9, 9, 10, 10. Try it. 10, 10. Beautiful, isn't it? Ten. So listen for the rhythm. So ten, ten, nine, nine, nine. Nice and loud. Nine, nine. Excellent. Good. Let's do ten and eleven now. Okay. So this is a. Oh, wow. And you notice it almost sounds smaller, so it, you know, so it's, it's an 11. 11. Excellent. Got it. Okay, good. There. Okay. So, Obviously, for us to get so that we really become acquainted takes time and reflection. And um, ultimately, though, the ability to sense it is crucial. And that I think very important to take home is the idea that you're actually hearing beautifully. It's never been a problem of hearing. It's being able to understand it. Okay, so what's going on? I'm going to do a little plug of missionary zeal here. I have in-laws who are missionaries. So, and grandparents who are missionaries, um, my husband's side. So, it's really important that in the future we're teaching this stuff at, to kids and that they can do it. Believe me, that would be the next thing is to, it's really something that children can hear and then they know what they're doing. It's crucial for us because we know we can communicate. If we agree that we can sense a 10 in the same way, then we can communicate. But if I'm sensing a 10 differently than somebody else who's sensing it a different way than somebody else and somebody else, we cannot have musical communication. Music communication relies on common sensory experiences, and that's why it is so valuable to work in a group and actually hear others who are having that experience because, wow, imagine how many times you're answering at the same time as somebody and that you're agreeing, therefore communicating. So. Um, I would like to do one thing now that I hope will be kind of a, a, a make you feel very proud of yourselves, and that is, believe it or not, in about 10 minutes, you're going to be doing this. You're going to be telling me the scale degree in the soprano and the, the chord that is accompanying it at this speed. So you're going to be saying three and a one chord, two and a five chord, one and a one chord, one and a four chord, seven and a five chord, one and a one chord. Okay, let's see if we can do it in about... 15 minutes, okay? All right, we're using all the knowledge that we're, we've come up with here, and that's going to be very important. <laughs> Bless you. Great. Now, the first thing is how to recognize scale degrees. And we can use what we already know. You can tell what the scale degree is because there are only seven notes in a diatonic scale. Of those seven notes, six are non-tonic, okay? So if we have the note C is the tonic note, it's the first note, the resting note in the scale. Then we have the seventh note that is leading to it and is looking up. It's a seventh. And the second degree looks down. Those are the two dissonant degrees. Then we have the sixth degree, which is modal and looking up. We have the third degree that's modal and looking down. We have the fifth degree that's perfect and looking up, and the fourth degree that's perfect and looking down. So if you actually use the preceding, excuse me, page, a couple pages back, <coughs> three pages back, this one. These are what I call the tendencies of the notes, okay? and. Essentially, 
In this diagram here, what you see is that it's like a magnetic field, and this differs from the way that we were taught the degrees of the scale. So what we're taught is in the traditional model, we have these degrees. We're taught, by the way, I'm going to put little carrot tops so that we know that they're degrees, which is like they're ordinal numbers, like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, like first place, second place. But my dichord numbers that we were just using, they're called cardinal numbers. They don't have an ending. They're a two or a three or a five. We have to keep those straight, okay? Because you know a sixth can be an eight or a nine. A third can be a three or a four. All right, so the traditional way that we uh, resolve the notes is we do this. Two goes down to one. Three goes down through two to one. Four has a little mini resolution to three, but ultimately, and we know why now, because of this fourth degree is not in the overtone series of the tonic. So it's resolving downward to the third. Can everyone see okay? I know it's kind of and then the fifth degree also resolves down. The sixth degree resolves to the fifth, but ultimately, we're taught, it tends down. The seventh degree is the only one that tends up. So the great theorist Heinrich Schenker would say that basically it's five, four, three, two, one. And then, but that is how things work. Six is an upper neighbor to five, but everything descends. Okay, so this is kind of the traditional model. I want to say, I don't think that's right. I'm going to say I don't think it's right because it doesn't sound right. So I tried teaching initially using that, and it just didn't work. So watch this. Well, obviously, that resolves up, right? Obviously, that resolves down. Obviously, we know it's a third, resolves down. This. Yeah, it resolves through seven to one because it's looking up. This one resolves down. It's the fourth degree. But listen to this. The fifth degree is resolving up, not down. So it creates a symmetrical pattern where the tonic is acting as a kind of a, to a center, a true center. And I do feel almost that it's a magnetic center almost if you imagine a, the, the sun and then the orbiting planets, they're all gravitating towards that center. And I do think, again, it's kind of like an, a magnetic field. So folks, let me, do, I'm in the key of G, if you want to follow me. So you guys are going to say what degree it is. So if you use that, you'll see the second degree, second, second, two, good, and you'll say third, fourth, third. Good. Now, to be really clear, use the ordinal, right? So you'll say fourth, third, fourth, third, second, third, second, first, seventh, sixth, fifth, right? Sixth, seventh, first, good. And we can just say the right <laughs> one. I know, just so that's what, so just so we don't get confused there. So here we go. So again, seventh. Sixth, seventh, sixth, fifth, sixth, fifth, seventh, first, second, first, second, first, third. Good. And you, can you hear that they're modal, dissonant, and perfect? In other words, the third degree is modal. And so that's how the third and sixth degrees act in this piece. finally a dissonant, okay? It's watch. In terms of degrees, one, one, six, five. Well, why don't you guys tell me? One, one, six, five. One, three, five, 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 six, five, four, three, five, 
four, four, five. Good. So the piece is made up of mostly modal and perfect degrees. And it's supposed to be the new world. So it has this feeling of being innocent, of pure, emotional, uh, loving, tender. And only at the, when he has to have his dominant seventh does he finally get our dissonance, which is great because it creates motion to our, our end cadence. So tell me again what the degrees are. So first, <laughs> first, second, first, seventh, first, seventh, first, second, first, Right. <laughs> Good. It is. <laughs> We're going to get rid of that in a second. Okay. So you know what happens? Watch this. So what I observed was that in tonality, our perception of the musical pitch space is distorted by the tonic. Okay. So you have noticed today when I did that atonal melody, it was easier than when I did the tonal ones. And you probably felt very annoyed that you were making certain kinds of mistakes. And why am I calling that a third? And when it's not the third, it's something else. And it has to do with the fact that I was probably playing the third degree implied. And thus you're hearing actually at a deeper level. So what's happening is, and I discovered this the hard way, uh, I was using the idea that I had in my undergraduate training that atonal music is harder than tonal. And so I was trained to hear atonally. I mean, I, by the end of my senior year, I, you know, I could do these kinds of weird dictation things you know, and all kinds of very difficult chords. And I could do that. When I went to study with Boulanger after that, she get tested me with, for my ear by doing something like this. And I could tell her what the notes were for my relative pitch, because I had a pretty good, I held my law in my head and I could figure out one of the other notes and then mentally do it by die chords. And she said, OK, check. You don't have to do anything. You do not have to go to any of those ear training classes, solfege classes, at the Paris Conservatoire. And I was so grateful, because those are murder. They're just murder. So she, she basically let me get past it without any further um, conversation. I subsequently followed her to Fontainebleau, the conservatory, American conservatory there. And I had to join the, the ranks of all of her students and had to take a difficult and very comprehensive oral exam that lasted hours. And it went from the easiest to the most difficult. And it was probably, without exaggeration, the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Because I don't think I could have told you the intervals in Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But I could tell you what the intervals were in a, 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 an aria of Otsek. A solo line. And I thought I was insane. But it was very embarrassing because I really did badly in the first three levels. And then I did extremely well in the upper levels that were sort of atonal, harmony, melody. I did really well. And they did not know what to do with me because they thought I was some sort of a freak. And I had this little woman whose name is Mademoiselle Dieudonné, which means God given. Um, that was Boulanger's ear training, solfege teacher for her students. And Mademoiselle Dieudonné, who is this tall, about 85 years old, with her white hair and a chi tight chignon, round potato body, comes up to me, strong as a, an ox, and says, Oh, là, mais c'est stupide. You know, it's just stupid. Why couldn't, how could you possibly have wiped out in those basic areas and then did really well in the advanced? We don't know what to do with you. You weren't paying attention. It's clear. There's nobody who could have done what you did there and then done so badly. In the, so we don't know what to do with you. And that's how she left. And then I knew she was going to tell my, you know, bab, my Boulanger. And Boulanger saw me and she said, uh, you know, I don't, it doesn't surprise me you're an American. <laughs> which means you've got lousy training and uh, un uneven training, very, uh, you know, unbalanced training in her view. So, agreed. So she said, get out of the classes and just 
sing these pieces in solfege, and I want you to transpose them to all keys, and play these chord progressions and transpose them to all keys. When you can do this, then go back into the advanced class, and then go back to the simpler class and see how you do. And thankfully, I did that, because then when I went to the University of Michigan after leaving Paris, I had to take a, one of those typical graduate level ear training courses to, for them to, so I could place out of ear training. If I hadn't done that, I would have wiped out and I would have been back in a probably freshman level ear, ear training. They would have had no idea about what I could do, okay? But I thought I was, you know, there was something wrong with me, really bad. And I'm telling you, by the end of that test, when I took that at Fontainebleau, I really, it was the lowest I've ever been. I just went for a walk in the forest at Fontainebleau because it was like I had a nervous breakdown because I just couldn't figure it out. I, I couldn't tell what the intervals were. It didn't make any sense, but this is why. So I'm going to be in the key of G major. The thing is that I would find is that I'm not the only one, because when I was training students then, my first 10 students, to hear atonal stuff really fast, you know, these kinds of things, you know, so they could do these exams that were atonal, I then asked them to just tell me, okay, so tell me what the intervals are in this Bach chorale. could not do it at all. I asked another student, could not do it at all. So I knew at that point at least three of us were mentally deficient. But, you know, I tested everybody and none of them could, could do it. So I thought, what in the world is going on? And so what I found out was this. This is the only fourth in the key of G major that sounds like here comes the bride. This doesn't. It has a completely different feeling. This one is from scale degree two to five. They don't, they don't sound even remotely like Here Comes a Bride until. And the reason is, is it depends on where things are in this magnetic field. Okay, so if I can, my eraser here. So let's say I have the way we're often taught. Okay, so here's my scale. And what I was showing you before is that I think that this is what's happening. And the result is, when I play a perfect fourth from here to here, they're both in the same field. And in fact, I'm landing on the tonic. But what would happen if I play, let us say, from two up to five? Well, two is looking down, but five is looking up. And is it possible that it would feel larger? Here's one, five up to one. Now if I did this, two up to five. Doesn't that feel like it's open? It's a fourth. And now it's looking up, but this one is looking down. So it's distorting our perception of pitch space. All right, depending on where things are. So if I, for example, have this major third, it could sound a lot different than this one. Here's the, this is a dichord four. So is this. But this one sounds huge. But it's still a dichord four. It's modal, the top of the nose looks down, the bottom is harmonic. It is. But it's that there's a deeper organization that's happening, and that is that the brain is now going to a deeper level, and it's organizing so it is perceiving how every note relates to the tonic. And only secondarily does it care about what the intervals are that get us from one place to the next. 
It's important though, that's the journey, is <laughs> how we get from one degree to another. That's what a melody is and a particular tune. But this is what makes it difficult. Let me show you another one. This is the major third from four up to six. Four is pulling down and six is pulling up, okay? But listen to this one, five and seven. I'm sorry, I would have said that interval's much smaller. This is much larger. This is much smaller, but they're both the same size. They're both dichord fours. This feels big and baggy. This one, now they're both going in the same field. This is six up to one. Now, listen to this third. Scale degree seven, the seventh to the second degree. Tiny, tiny. And of course, it's because the tonic is in the inside. Listen to this one again. It seems just different, quite a bit different. So the idea is that we're being influenced by what I call tonal gravity, and that it's a very big deal because it's a lot of what causes us to have a distortion, but it's also the very most important things in terms of telling us a lot about expression and about how things work. That the dichord three between scale degree two and four does not equal that minor third dichord three between seven and two, or six and one. They're all different. And so this is why people who are unmusical do this. Whereas musical people go. And we just know it's congruent. And then I do this. I didn't do this. And then. That means there are seven different sounding thirds in the diatonic scale. <laughs> okay. But do not be disturbed because you already answered, you knew so well what those scale degrees are. All right, so let's go back to our scale degrees. Tell me what I'm playing. I'm playing what I call the tonic drone exercise, but I, you could, did the, the Dvorak without my having to have the drone. So this is just acting as an anchor to reinforce the tonic, not necessary, okay? But one, first, second. And you notice how that feels like a very large interval, but it's just a three. Fifth, now, now it feels like it's pulling way down. Third, fourth, first, second, even louder, third, second, thank you, seventh, first. Good, and it's this guy, sixth, seventh, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> anticipation. So this is a, and think of it as the emotional one, right? So it's modal, sixth, fifth, sixth, fifth, sixth, seventh, first, second, seventh, first, second. It's so close though, what is it? Everybody, what degree is that? Seventh, good, first. Good, good, be louder, okay? Third, you don't need to be too quiet. Third, thank you. Fourth. Excellent. So each degree is either modal perfect or dissonant to the tonic, and it's either looking down or looking up to the nearest tonic. It's very easy. You're never more than a fourth away from the nearest tonic. And you can tell that that just, that's what will happen in, in my work, is I'll work, somebody can't do something. And then it's like, no, there's gotta be a better way. It's not that they can't do it because they're not smart. There's gotta be a better way to do this. And then, uh, and working with 40 people, as I had the honor to do, it would be really, so helpful because then I go, wow. And it would always be a reason. There would always be a reason that folks were having troubles when they're paying attention. Now, when you have reaction anticipation and looking back, 
I can't fix that <laughs> because that's really about psychological states. But you guys have that power. So you can really trust your ear. Now I'm going to do one thing. See now? We've got our scale degrees. Let's do this. A little bit more time. All righty. Now, folks, some of you won't know this, but um, there are three major chords in any major scale. There are just three of them. And they're going to happen wherever you have a dichord four. Okay? So it's going to be above the first degree, the one chord as we call it. It's made up of the scale degrees one, three, and five. Okay? Yeah, this pen might not make it. Three and five. Okay. What's another one? Major chord. Excellent. Four. It's the only other place where you have, if you go on F to G to A, it's a whole step, another half, a whole step, which means it's a four. Okay, two twos. And what degrees are in the four chord, therefore? And, and one. Very good. First. Fourth, sixth, and first. What's the other chord? That's, it's the five chord, so it's built on G. Okay. So what degrees would be in the five chord? Five. Excellent. Okay. So what this means is the one chord will be very stable for the reasons we already understand. It's going to have a note that's in the overtone series, the third and the fifth. And so it's harmonious to the overtone series of the tonic, and I think our brain is organizing that way. This chord, the four chord, will not be as stable. It won't be as stable because it has the fourth degree, which is unstable and pulls down. It's perfect, but non-harmonic and pulls down. Remember that sixth degree? A goes up to B, uh, you know, B and up to C in the key of C major, so the sixth degree is going up. It's unstable, needs to resolve. And then it does have the tonic, though, so the four chord has one in it. How about the five chord? Well, it has the fifth degree, which is harmonious with the tonic, but it also has seven and it also has two. So this is a very active chord. Very, very active sounding. All right. So what I'm going to do now is with a different pen. Put degrees on here. Whoop. Well, let's go black. My blue is probably my best bet. But here we go. So I'm going to put these degrees here. These represent notes that could be in the melody. And so it's going to be numbers 1 through 7. And what we're going to do is figure out how to harmonize these. That means how they'll sound harmonious. And the way they'll sound harmonious is they'll be one of the members of these chords. If they're not, there's going to be a dissonance with somebody. There's going to be a dissonance somewhere. Therefore, it won't be as consonant. So in which chords does scale degree 1 occur? both one and four. So what I'm going to do is put capital Roman numerals, one and four. So we have two choices. How about the second degree? Which one is, which chord or chords? It's only in the five chord. Now that what that means is, if you hear two in the melody and you hear a major chord, it's got to be five. There's no other choice. Okay. Three. One option. If you hear three in the soprano and it's in a major chord, it has to be the one chord. Four, just in the four chord. So if you hear four in the soprano or in the melody, it's going and it's a major chord, it's a four chord. Okay, it's a triad. And then five? Good, and I'm going to put five first because I'd like it to be the root of something and then the fifth below it. So this was the root of a one chord and the fifth of a four chord. Let me say that again. <laughs> C is the root of the C chord, but it's the fifth of an F chord. <laughs> and similarly here, G in the key of C is the root of a G chord, but the fifth of the one chord C. Six is in which chord? Only four. And seven is in? Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to now play in a... Tell me what scale degree is in the soprano. So, one, two, 
three, four, two, three, five, six, five, very good. Five, five, four, three, two, one, one. Good, now tell me, can you see around my head? Probably can't. Can you see this okay if I'm playing? Probably not. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you see okay? Can you guys see it all right? So what you guys are going to know is if I play one, it's going to be in one or a four. There's not a, another choice. It's going to be one in either one or four. <laughs> and if it's two, it's going to be in five. If it's three, it's going to be in one. So you're going to so tell me the two numbers. First of all, the scale degree in the top, and then the chord, like this. Try it. One and a one. Two and a, what chord does it have to be? Three and a one. Three and a one, nice and loud. Two and a five. Three and a one. Four and a four, three and a one, two and a five, one and a one, good. That's a surprise to most people. It should be one and a, one and a four, seven and a five. Wanna do some more? Okay, you've just got them all right, okay? One and a one. Good. <laughs> Keep going. Isn't that funny? So three and a one, five and a one, five and a, feels like it's relaxed, doesn't it? Versus this, six and a four, five and a five, that's the verb, the fast flowing brook. <laughs> okay. So six and a four, five and a five, Five and a one. Good, louder if you can. Six and a four. Five and a one. Six and a four. Five. One and a one. Good. One and a, no, you're actually you were right, one and a before, one and a four. Many people think I've moved off, watch this. One and a one. They hear the bass move, but the soprano stayed the same, so keep your ear on that soprano. So, one and a one. One and a four, now, seven and a five. Put in the yes time really you guys thank you so much for everything and uh, I look forward to um, hearing from you if you ever want to write I left some cards there and would be happy to be in touch but I want to thank you so much for your excellent attention thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Go forth and conquer. <laughs>